Welcome to 12 Bar News. I'm the Fox, your host. With me as always is Bullwinkle, Darsh, and Badger. What's going on, guys? Chilling. Hey. I'm yep. doing pretty good, man. Good to hear. We're just going to jump right into our news segment, or as we like to call it on the 12 Bar News podcast. What's happening? <laughs> All right, I believe that Badger, you were going to start us off with one of your what's happenings. Sure. So my first one was MF Doom. He said recently in an interview uh, celebrating the 15th anniversary of the Mad Villainy albums that they actually have several albums, up to three albums I heard of unreleased material uh, that was like a follow-up of it. So that uh, is pretty cool. I would like to hear several of those albums and uh in that same interview he also talks about his approach to songwriting and producing and he also uh talks a lot about his son uh who he lost last year so uh it was a good interview and um i want to hear some of that mad villainy stuff what do you guys think definitely want to hear that uh mad villainy is one of the Hip hop barely gets better than that, really. I, w- I think it may be my favorite hip hop album of all time. It's that good. Yeah, it it is that good. Um, I mean, like, wow, yeah, just a fantastic, fantastic album. Uh, all uh, right, do, do you, we have do any you more? Know, wait, do you I know have... if he's recorded it with Mad with Madlib because that was the producer slash beat maker that he worked with on mad villainy right um he yeah they were all in the same house slash studio he went in and talked about kind of that process that was in his uh mad lib actually had a old bomb shelter as a recording studio so it had no windows it was underground it was a literal bomb shelter and they did it all the recording in there and then the rest of the whole house was like the studio and he was talking about uh, just rapping along to the beat in the car and everywhere he kind of went for that time period and they produced several albums worth of stuff. Um, that's interesting, a bomb shelter. So as a uh, sound engineer of sorts or, you know, uh, aspiring sound engineer, yeah. wh- however you want to call it. How I'd do say you think expert. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you think the sound would be in... Uh, a bomb shelter. I think it could be really cool if it was fitted right, which I'm sure it was with the right acoustic treatment. It would also be soundproof, so no leakage, uh, no dogs barking. Uh, <laughs> no. So none of that stuff would really penetrate. Uh, and um, it would also just be a really private space, but it wouldn't be Like if you're talking about like echoes and reverberation and stuff like that, you would really get a dead space because the walls are so thick and there's not much room for it to echo off of it, especially with some studio foam and the like diffusers. Yeah. You always hear about uh, artists going to, you know, secluded locations to record their stuff. And uh, I know that, sound quality is not really like the only factor some of it is like atmospheric right you know like mm-hmm. artists want to be in the right atmosphere when they record um yep but i've always wondered about certain places like i know that led zeppelin went to some like cottage it was like a haunted uh, house wasn't it <laughs> i don't know about that but uh or i i can't imagine it was um it was a cottage has great uh you know sound to it but i'm sure they had some kind of makeshift wasn't it the the church of satan's uh leader's house no no look it up are we talking about branya r no it's head it's called headley grange It's it's in hampshire england wasn't that jimmy page's house um i don't think he actually bought it although i think he owns it now I'm, I'm not, we're, we're, this is all, none of us know what we're talking about. Let, well, I, I know the I know, name. Uh, Alistair Crawley's house. I don't think Crowley owned that, dude. I think, no, I think Jeff is, uh, I, or uh, Badger, rather, is, is The name's correct. not Jeff. 
Yes, uh, I am correct. I'm here on the Rolling Stone magazine's webpage. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say you're wrong. No. Yeah, you're you're wrong. I'm <laughs> telling right, you so, right now, you're wrong. So we'll clarify this and we'll put it up on uh, social media, and uh, whoever is right will have bragging rights. It'll um, be it'll be me. But back to the uh, the the whole point is. Uh, it always interests me what how artists choose their like uh, remote recording locations. A bomb shelter is a first. I've never heard that one. Yeah, that's a first for me as well. Uh, Jimmy definitely... Page once owned Alistair Crawley's former home. Yeah, he owned it, but it's not Headley <coughs> Grange. Well, yeah, I don't and know. It if was they haunted there. That's where he lived. They didn't record there. Do you think that ghosts uh, provide? good acoustics this has gone off the rails <laughs> <laughs> i think that the this this is a good uh topic for another podcast we could go on for a while about the okay. astro yeah. interference of the the different uh oh, spiritual true. planes and yeah they they could pick up like uh the ghosts on the you know speaking speaking of like ghosts and stuff <laughs> do you think that like cryptozoological creatures uh would be interested in 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 music uh, i.e the uh the bigfoots and the uh loch ness monsters Yo, of the Bigfoot world is in the punk band is he what's yeah. the punk band called it's called smallfoot it's it's an <laughs> ironic punk band didn't bigfoot also own alistair crowley's house <laughs> yeah man. that's where he was he burped. built it he built yeah. it <laughs> with his own two feet um okay what's next on the docket so i also wanted to just mention that warp tour announced today which is april fool's day but apparently was not a joke that they opened up a bunch of more tickets for the atlantic city one which at last check they were going for 200 dollars a piece uh but they also announced more bands for all the shows and tickets Currently, currently at the time of recording, Ohio sold out already, even though they just announced today. Um, wow. So still a lot of interest in that. I don't know if 200 bucks, but again, Vans will wear your shoes forever. If you just, you know, you can invite us in. It'll be fun. We'll do our You won't thing. even have to give us free shoes. Just let us come. No, we'll buy shoes. I'll we'll be buy your- shoes, but yeah. wear them forever. Um, if nobody else has anything on the what's happening section, oh, uh, Mick Jagger is, yeah, uh, there we go. He, they had to cancel their, the Rolling Stones. If, if you guys are dumb, uh, Mick Jagger <laughs> is the lead singer and he, uh, has to get emergency heart surgery. So they postponed their tours, um, across North America and yeah, I mean, Get better I mean, soon, how, how, old. how old is he? He's yeah, I think like... according to Wikipedia, he's about 364 <laughs> years old. <laughs> but I think I just may have put that up there a few minutes before recording. So, yeah, he's 75. Don't fact check me. Yep. Yeah, he's 75. <laughs> Fake news. Been three quarters of a century old. Jesus. I mean, you know, he. Uh... But he's still rocking it like yeah, every I year. Yeah, I and uh, yeah, I think he, that he it's only... because he's some some sort of hallucination from Keith Moon that has like he took so many not Keith Moon sorry um, blah, 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 what's his name <laughs> I, I want to say um, Keith Urban but I don't think that's not <laughs> Keith Richards oh yes yes Toby okay oh, wow. one of the Toby Keith um, <laughs> <laughs> one of those people uh took so many drugs that it like sparked this mass hallucination and that is who Mick Jagger is it's just a, are you, a persona are That's you saying are you saying that Mick Jagger is a Tupelo I I think I am do you know what a Tupelo is I think it it's some kind of no <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to um, believe that yeah <laughs> Um, geez, Badger, you really got to watch your mouth, man. Um, um but anyways, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting theory. And, uh, do you have anything else for what's happening for us? Uh, I think we should, uh, at least mention the, uh, 2019. Yeah, I, Hall of Fame I was, inductees. I was about to get to that. So, um, there's some uh, good bands, uh, got inducted this year. 
Uh, some One bands I like. Incredible band. Um, so the we cure? have De- we have Def Leppard, uh, Janet Jackson, Roxy Music, N- uh, Stevie Nicks, who I love. Stevie Nicks. Uh, the Z- that's her second time. Yep, that's her second time. She's already in there with Fleetwood Mac. Uh, the Zombies, who are fairly deserving of of being in there. Uh, I'm not surprised it took this long to get them in. Uh, the Cure, obviously, uh, great band that you know definitely deserves to be in there and then the enigmatic the esteemable radiohead darsh uh what can i say i mean they're my favorite band they definitely deserve it uh they were on a tough list too i don't know if you saw the nominees like they they were on a uh, tough list rage i mean i i don't really have a lot else to say other than the fact that it was gonna happen eventually anyway yeah um I'm a little surprised it happened this early uh, to be, you know, just because the Rock and Roll uh, Hall of Fame has a long history of um, putting off uh, yeah. artists, like nominating them multiple times. And then, yeah. But, uh, yeah, they, you know, they, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know how Roxy Music and uh, Janet Jackson beat out Rage Against the Machine to get in. But. Yeah. There's I, some debate over whether Janet Jackson is truly rock and roll, but I'm sure I I have heard some rock and songs. Uh, I don't I mean, think that really bad. matters. Uh, like whether or not here's the thing: the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is the crock of shit. Like <laughs> uh, it, it really is. It really is. Yeah. Like it's cool when one of your favorite bands gets nominated, but like the from what I've heard. Uh, heard and read about the uh, nomination process is like it's a lot of like they take into account like um, how uh, the impact of the band like heavily weighs on their decision right um, you know which is understandable but it would be nice if like um, you know musicianship, songwriting ability took more of a front uh and center yeah you know if it was weighted more heavily i would like to see that i mean um, but yeah. you, you can definitely that was tell the... that it's like the rolling stone like favorites yeah always, always i mean chosen. if you look like some of the bands that were nominated this year devo dope yeah. freaking band mark mother's ball is a, a, a damn genius and... mc5 rage against the machine like there's some bands that got nominated that definitely uh, should already either be in like, I I mean the impact that rage had on the music scene in the, like when they, when they were like at their Zenith was insane. It, they spawned tons of shitty bands that decided rap metal was a good idea. This good is a bad band. It's a shitty band. A a very shitty band. And for a band like Def Leppard to beat Rage Against the Machine yeah. is just, is awful to me. I mean, I'm not I'm not shitting. Bullwinkle's a fan of Def Leppard. Okay, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Let, let me let me just say let me just say something real quick. He's over I there think crying. De- hold on, hold on. I think Def Leppard needs a hand. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I think they needed a hand. Ooh. Uh, Ooh, shots fired. They're 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 not a bad band. I'm not hating on them. But Pour some there's... sugar on me is a great fucking song. I love that song. Yeah, uh, um, but I, I just don't think I just don't think they're as deserving as a band like Rage but... or Devo. Shit, like, but that's what you're saying with the musicianship yeah. coming into play. It, it really doesn't. Badger, hands off the keyboards, Devo. please. I, I know it's Devo, but we we are not Devo. We we don't um, want to get that. Would sued, be really sued. cool if we were, man. I I'm mean, really I'd happy. be excited about it. I- I'm happy that the Cure got uh, put in. That they, they, they definitely deserve it. Yeah. Um, yep. They, I hear I'm, they have a new album coming out as well. That uh, uh, he says it's good. So he says it's going to piss off a lot of people. So that's probably yeah. You know, like every other Cure album. Um. To an extent. Uh, yeah. Uh. But that's my take on the. Uh, 2019 inductees. I think it was a better than average year. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when when you just look at the nominee list, like good, very good bands were nominated, and and very good musicians and bands made it in. So, 
Yeah. But yeah. So we are going to move on. Next segment is going to be Grinds My Gears. <laughs> Darsh, take it away. Um, okay. So Grinds My Gears. Uh, so the other day I was watching TV and I saw a car commercial uh, which contained uh, a song from a band that I really like. And I really like the song as well. Uh, and it really grinded my gears. And uh, I I just couldn't fathom why the band would um, compromise their art in order to attempt to sell me a car. Um, and I was pretty I was pretty steamed about it for a while, but I I've been wrestling with this uh, you know this idea in my head for a couple of days now, uh, and I actually wanted to get your guys' input on it. Uh, so the I did a little bit of research, and uh, I, I looked into. Uh, music industry sales over the last um, uh, four decades or so. Uh, and the data I have goes from uh, 1977 to uh, uh, 2017. And my source is the I RIAA. Um, yep. And sales uh, peaked in around uh, the late 90s or early 2000s. Uh, music industry sales were around 21 billion dollars um most of that being uh compact disc but some of it cassette um and uh you know after that it plummeted because everyone was downloading their music and uh limewire you know and, <laughs> and you know there were the napsters the kazaz the limewire soul seek um, yeah, I'm I'm sure I'm sure. Uh, and you know, <laughs> later uh BitTorrent and uh you know, the music industry uh took a hit and it's only very recently with the um uh platform uh subscription model, you know, your Apple Music and your Spotify uh that a it's little that more. Yes. So right now, the, so the Valley it hit in 2014. Uh, was 6.9 billion down from 21 billion uh, just a, a decade before, um, and it, it's gone up about a, a billion since then. But still, anyway, it's the point I'm trying to get to is 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 it wrong for me to be mad that a artist is trying to basically use their music to um make money well and i i don't really know uh I, I you know at the end of the day being a musician is still their job if making money off of their material allows them to make more great music then i guess but i, I think don't about really it. see the problem with it it's not that they wrote that song for the car commercial. The car well, commercial, exactly. they decided to use that as a, a product endorsement as of sorts. And so they said, oh, this band thinks that you should buy this car or right. this this band. But they didn't write that song. So their artistic, in a way, their artisticness, uh, the creativity was already recorded into the wax, as it were. It wasn't. I'm going to get really famous and sell this to Lincoln. And then Matthew McConaughey is going to be like, all right, all right, all right. I drive it because it's nice. Uh, but so the, the only thing I want to point out is it, the artist is taking the chance that I don't now associate that song with the product that they're you but, know tying it to. It, I agree, but this is also sort of that whole uh, kind of punk rock sort of corporate, um, anti-corporate philosophy of selling out that uh, is true. Like, it's an important part, uh, but it's 
to like what extent like what what's this band let's name check uh tame impala yeah Ooh. that's a hipster band <laughs> yeah uh it, i think it goes just beyond uh, yeah. see i was i was thinking you were gonna say like an older band and then i was no it's uh it's, you know they're it, they're still they're, making relevant music in um, they're they're a prominent band in like the indie they just right put now. out some material i've been seeing uh, I don't know their stuff. Oh, but... they're they're great. Uh, oh, you'd you en- have, you would enjoy them. Yeah, if you haven't yeah. heard their uh, their 2015 album Currents is mm. probably one of my favorite albums of this decade so far. Bullwinkle, um, you're a corporate guy. What's your opinion? Uh, I don't even know why there is a stigma associated with it. I mean, it's not like the band is endorsing the product or anything. Right. The company's using the band to drive traffic to whatever they're trying to sell. Yeah, but, I I did, it, I did yeah, a whole project turning, about commercials. You're taking art, you're taking art and turning it into something that is used to sell other things, uh, which detracts from the original message of the art to begin with. Uh, th- that's why I'm. I'm questioning. I'm on the fence. You know, if you right. asked me five five years ago, I would have been really pissed off uh but you know i turned 30 uh over the weekend so maybe now i'm i'm i've softened happy birthday the... oh thank you but uh yeah i still don't know i'm still struggling with it for yeah for the they've also used in commercials uh carl sagan's spoken word for an apple commercial They've used the Bright Eyes song. They've used like Van Gogh uh, art and all this for different commercials over the years. And so in one way, this is a current band that's supposed to be uh, making new art now. uh, And those were kind of past. But it's yeah, I agree with Bullwinkle. It, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the artist gets paid. They get to choose whether or not they even want to tie their name to the product. When I, I was mean, a teenager, I would have definitely, or even 10 years ago or whatever, I would have said that. Um, yeah. That I, I would agree completely that it was the wrong thing to do and that they should be shunned and put back into their hipster enclave <laughs> in, in, New, yeah. in uh, the Bronx or wherever you guys, you know, cluster from, they're, and they're, do they're your hipster Australia. things. Yeah, the Bronx. <laughs> he we'll, voted for yeah, AOC, I'm sure. We'll do a geography lesson later. Um, but, okay. I can uh, host. I get, yeah, to to Bullwinkle's point, at the end of the day, if it'll, if I, I still like the song and it allows the artist to stay in the game and like, a, you know, like the data points out, um, you know, the just because you're a musician, and you're in a successful band does not mean that you're swimming in cash. And even if you did, even if you were swimming in cash, you know, uh, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a terrible thing to, uh, you, you know, use your songs in ads or let, you know, it, use it for advertising purposes. But uh, yeah, that's my grinds my gears or not grinds my gears we should uh see what the audience has to say so yeah, uh, yeah. leave some I, comments yeah. on twitter and facebook you can find us at the 12 bar news podcast uh like us and you'll get what's happening and grinds my gears all week long and if you guys comment we'll probably mention you on the show and either troll you or uh you know just say your name really loud or do something obnoxious i don't know Right. Uh, and I think we can do a survey. Um, yeah, we'll put we a can... survey up. Yep. Yeah. That's a good yeah. idea. I'm on it. Okay. Th- thanks, Jeff. My name's oh, not gosh. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and now we will be moving on to the main event for this podcast, which is main uh, event. another top five list. But it's a very good top five list and one that is near and dear to both mine and Bullwinkle's hearts as we are drummers. And this topic this week will be 
top drummer from each decade starting in the 60s. So 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s to today. Best, your, in your opinion, the best drummer of each of those decades. And we are going to start it off with the Badger. Badger, who do you have? So I first just want to start off by saying I think it's fitting that the best drummer of the band goes first. So I thank you for the honors (laughs) and I accept them with with pride. So my first. Hey, Jeff, what's a what's a paradiddle? It's where you go. (laughs) Isn't that that what Michael Jackson did to those? (laughs) Paradiddles. Ah! All right. (laughs) Badger, please take it away. Keith Moon is my top for the 60s. So the reason being is he was just so powerful and mad when he was drumming. He had that big sound, but he was heavy with the tom-toms and with his double bass. He was one of the first people to employ that double bass on stage, not the pedal, but the two basses. And his kits just got bigger and bigger. So he had more stuff to destroy, and um, he did like to destroy stuff and blow stuff up and do drugs. And he was just an inspirational drummer to a lot of the other people that are on my list. And I think he was very influential, and he he liked to uh, blow up toilets in his hotel room. And with like he would literally blow like flush down explosives, and uh, I just think that that makes him a good drummer. The fact if you that can he pull was, someone like, out of the audience to like sub in for you, does that really make you that good? Yeah, yeah. So the fact you that can he do was whatever you want. Ill, the fact that he was mentally ill made him a good drummer. I think that helps. I mean, it, it works in my <laughs> case. Yeah, I, I think it. I think it. Every time you hit a drum, don't you lose a brain cell? Uh, it depends on it, whether or not you're hitting it with your head. Well, <laughs> how do you guys play drums? <laughs> have I been doing it wrong? <laughs> you may have. Uh, Keith Moon's a good choice. I mean, he's played with. I mean, he's. Uh, if you don't know, he's uh, one of the members of the Who. And, but he was also he also played with Plastic Ono Band. Yep, and and uh, the Jeff Beck Group. Yeah, yeah, yep. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was. Um, I, he wasn't one of the the founding members or anything. I think he played in the one or two shows that John like just threw together. All right. Uh, if I if I'm not mistaken, I, I can look that up real quick before I say definitely. Yeah, yeah. Let's no, let's but fact he check did. That one. <laughs> no, no, he was definitely in it uh, for the live performance uh, for okay. UNICEF, and then That's, he. Yeah. Um, there was also a companion disc that was some time in New York City. And uh, that was in like 1972 performance. So he was in that. Um, and he was, he did occasional collaborations with the Beatles too. When, you know, Ringo had a, had a broken arm. I might've made I, that part. I, up. I guarantee you <laughs> made that part up. It's just, it's so weird that the who has an amazing drummer or, or you know, an amazing, amazing bass player. I mean, uh, arguably the the best pairing uh, the of very, drum and bass. Very good guitar player, and I can't stand their music. Yeah, but, yeah, it's like Radiohead. It's <laughs> oh, uh, all right. We're just gonna go on to my fight. Next one. Yeah, fight. let's move. Fight. Let's move. Let's move on to actually next is Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle sixties. Oh, okay. All right. Actually, hold on. No, we are going to do Darsh next. Yeah, uh, because Bullwinkle I, and I, as the drummers, actually picked the same person. I think that uh, th- th- this topic is racist against non-drummers. I'm just gonna. Throw I that just out there. everybody's a drummer if they have a drum. I guess. Uh, all right. So my sixties choice is uh, <laughs> <laughs> profoundly stupid. Yes. <laughs> my sixties choice is uh, Mitch Mitchell, uh, the mm. drummer from the Jimi Hendrix Experience. And, uh, you know, dude was, dude was fire, man. Uh, and I'm, that's not a pun off of the Jimi Hendrix song <laughs> fire. Uh, actually the, the drums on that song are super good. Uh, the first, like the intro to that song, the, the drums are just 
so good. It, it, it really makes the track uh, and it really adds a good backdrop to, uh, you know, Jimmy's uh, wild and free guitar playing. Um, but I think more than anything, it's just he played so fast and aggressive um, and uh you know, he not a lot of people were doing that that early in in music. Uh, and for me, that that just uh, put him above the rest. Mitch Mitchell, arguably the Jimi Hendrix. Actually, no, definitely the Jimi Hendrix experience would not have been what it was without Mitch Mitchell. Um, he he was so basically how how the Jimi Hendrix experience worked was if if you have any other drummer who's you know just like lays in with the bassist um or you know who who a bass player and drummer who who don't really go nuts jimmy still is jimmy he's still going to soar but the music isn't going to be exciting not nearly as exciting and no redding the bass player for most of the band's existence was you know real simple kept it kept the kept the the middle line going Mm -hmm. And you just had Mitch Mitchell on one side and Jimi Hendrix on the other, just tearing the house down. Uh, yeah. Mitch Mitchell was actually my first choice when I, we were putting this list together for my 60s drummer. And then I really thought about, you know, which drums I liked the most and it, it landed me on my decision. But Mitch Mitchell is a great, great, great drummer, especially his energy. He, and uh, may, maybe this is just in my head, but I feel like he's like, like pre-punk. You know, like the, his style is very, uh, uh, like it's very like snare, trash can sound, kind of like uh, almost like gutter rock, and uh, I, I like it a lot. It's pretty close to that. Um, I, I I can't argue with you. Uh, there are drummers that I think uh, embody the the punk sound a little bit more, but he definitely had the punk energy more than most people. Both of your guys' choices were super like punk rock before there was punk rock. He covered um, for Keith Moon when they were replacing him in The Who uh, briefly. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, he filled in for the gigs for them. So I also I mean, had yeah. thought of him when uh, I was picking my drummer. But Keith Moon, he's he's the man. I mean, yeah, Keith Moon is the man, but so so is Mitch Mitchell. So we're going to move on to Bullwinkle's number, well, not number five, but uh, 60s choice, which is also my 60s choice. Uh, Bullwinkle, take it away. Yep, so for the 60s, uh, Fox and I had Hal Blaine. Mm. So he's not one of those household names that you like. You can listen to a record and know, yeah, that's Hal who's, Blaine playing Who's drums. that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he is a member of the Wrecking Crew, which is one of those. Uh, I'm not sure how to describe it. They're not like a band, and maybe Fox, you can shed some light on it. But it, it was more of like those set of musicians that you call for studio time. Yeah, he was a studio drummer. Right. So was he? Fe was he on like uh, Pet Sounds? Uh, okay, so I I'll go real quick. Um, if you've listened to any music in the nineteen from like the nineteen sixties, no, you've de you've definitely heard Hal Blaine play on um, some songs. So just some notable ones: uh, "I Get Around" by the Beach Boys. Okay. Um, "Help Me, Rhonda" by the Beach Boys. Uh, "Mr. Tambourine Man" by the Birds. The Birds cover of "Mr. Tambourine Man." Hmm. Um, he was on "Good Vibrations." Uh, meaning more likely than not, he played on a lot of the Pet Sounds album. Okay. Um, and if you're going to play on one of arguably the best albums ever like recorded, and not only because he, he wasn't like a drummer that like, yeah, dude could totally just like, like play, like play on fucking a one and three, like, like he could do the whole simple beats and all that. But, if you listen to pet sounds, some of the drumming on that is so it like inventive. Yeah. It's so like he's, he's defines the sixties for me. And I guess for bullwinkle as well, you have more to yeah. say on that. I mean, you don't need a flashy drummer all the time, like Mitch Mitchell or Keith moon. I mean, sometimes you really just need someone who can sit in the pocket, play on one and three and just drive the bus, so to speak. Yeah. 
So that, that's why I picked him at least. I don't have he, my commercial license, so I'm he's, kind of a flashy he's definitely he's definitely one of the best pocket drummers of all time. Like okay. he he yep. was taught by um, a guy named Roy Knapp, um, who also happened to have been the teacher of Gene Krupa, who is one of the best jazz drummers of all time. So Buddy he Rich. comes, yeah, Buddy Rich, <laughs> like yeah. I mean, buddy, let's not get into it because if we had go, if we had gone back a little bit further, we all like Buddy Rich would have been on everybody's yeah. list. Um, that dude's a, a monster in more ways than one. Um, I heard he was really difficult to deal with. Yeah, but yes, <laughs> so aren't all um, drummers? No. Yeah. What are you talking about, man? Bull Eagles a dickhead. Joke. They're drama queens. <laughs> is all I have to say. <laughs> Bull, Bullwinkle yeah. always has to be the star of the show. He's always, uh, you know, giving press yeah. Front interviews. Front and center. Yeah. 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 Making all the attention. Um, away. Yeah. And making I mean, stupid he, noises. He, I mean, how Blaine has played with some of the, the greatest uh, artists of all time. He's played with Frank Sinatra, Simon Garfunkel. Uh, he played with John Denver, which I, I didn't know. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool because John Denver is like, He's an all right guy. I'm not a huge fan of his music, but I know he in the 90s he stood up for freedom of speech when they were doing the whole uh, uh, um, like parental advisory on albums. So oh, he yeah. was. I know he was in the congressional hearings. But um, John Denver Sa- is punk rock. He's, Tipper Gore. He's, he's yeah. When t- the whole Tipper Gore thing. Right. Um, but and sadly, actually, um, I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, actually, uh, Hal Blaine just died. Um, oh, no. on March yeah, 11th. Yep. Yeah. A few weeks ago, he was 90 years old. Talk about a good run. He was 90 fucking years old. Well, it sounds like he was sort of, uh, all over the place. You know? I, I mean, he's, he's just that when it comes to music, it's awesome. He has the best, uh, drumming, uh, headstone, uh, inscription I've ever, ever heard. And, uh, may he rest forever on two and four. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, a lot of people came out and just like talked about him uh, after his death, like Ringo Starr. I know Brian Wilson uh, gave like gave a like a statement about it. Ronnie Spector, um, who was in uh, the Ronettes, uh, he played on all their their albums. Um, he, he was yeah, he was integral to the wall of sound that Phil Spector had. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, so in, the, speak, in the early 60s, yeah. Speaking of uh, Ringo Starr, I'm proud that none of us picked Ringo. Look, Ringo's Ringo, it's been said, all right, John Lennon was asked, is Ringo Starr the, like, the best drummer in the world? And his answer was, Ringo's not even the best drummer in the band. <laughs> so... Well, I love Ringo Starr and I yeah. love the Beatles. He's Ringo is I was, I was he did exactly him, what he needed to do. Yeah. I was going to put him on my like just overall best of all time, but I needed to really reserve that spot for Meg White. So yeah, I could it not. makes sense. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I when I was trying to come up with my list, you know, I I I, uh, I looked at a few other lists, and I I saw him on so many. I was just like, how is this possible? He's was not Meg, a bad drummer. Meg on there? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe in one. Can you um, hit more than one drum at the same time? <laughs> well, stop hating on Meg White, man. She <laughs> she did exactly what she needed to do. And uh, that is... Yes, yeah, she did. Home. That makes her a decent drummer. She's a decent drummer. But I, I for a fact a know... Pocket, a pocket drummer? No, no, she's not a <laughs> pocket drummer. I, I had a pocket drummer. It was this little like device where you can press the little buttons and synchronize some like you know. Drum. We don't want to hear about your sex toys. Get out of here, <laughs> Get out of here with your pocket drummer. But uh, yeah, Hal Blaine is is one of the the best. That's all I have to say. He um, was a pocket drummer. <laughs> will always be remembered, and he uh, he was one of the best pocket drummers of all time if jeff knew what that actually meant he might not throw it around like that (laughs) um all right let's move on to the next decade uh yes so badger your 1970s choice which hold on Uh, we're not no we're i'm gonna change the script a little bit here okay every single one of us put the same drummer for the 1970s ringo (laughs) star because it's more than obvious who the best drummer 
of the 1970s was. Now, there are great drummers from the 70s. Uh, There's drummers that rose to prominence in the 60s and played through the 70s. But this guy rose to prominence in 1969 with the greatest live band of all time, Led Zeppelin. And I am, of course, talking about John Bonham. So instead of just all of us saying it individually, Badger, why don't you give us a few words on what you think about John Bonham? He was a good pocket drummer. <laughs> <sighs> I am going to kill you one of these days. Oh. Uh, so <sighs> my, my, my favorite uh, John Bonham drumming song is probably rock and roll. Uh, the, the drums on that song are just amazing and uh, so loud. That's my favorite thing about John Bonham. He's so fucking loud. Uh, and I don't know. It was just the most rock and roll thing you could possibly imagine. It was great. Part of part of the thing from, from here on out, my list is uh, presence. Uh, it all has to do with presence behind the kit. And for me, John Bonham had the, the biggest presence behind the kit. He had this really weird... Um, and I think this is actually where it comes from. He had this really weird style where he would actually play along more with the guitar than he would with the bass. Um, he, he would constantly hit, uh, instead of accenting with the bass, he would ac- he would hit his accents with when Jimmy Page was playing a specific thing on the drums well, or on the lu- guitar. It's lucky that John Paul Jones was such, such a beast. He didn't need backup. Exactly. He just did it. So... The, the like John Bonham could probably do more with a four piece kit than most people could do with an eight piece kit. He had insanely fast hands. He, and the, the okay, so the, the one of the things about John Bonham, it's not to get all tongue tied, but not only did he play loud, he played loud when he needed to and didn't play at all when he didn't need to. Because a lot of the things that drummers miss is it's not what you like, what you do play, it's what you don't play. Mm. Um, and I actually take that with my drums when it comes to bass, not so much with the guitar, but the drum and bass, it's about what you're not playing. Uh, that becomes really important. It sounds a little pretentious, but it, no, it, not be- at all. it but it becomes important because I mean, if if a drummer gets in with Led Zeppelin and just like, is just banging out like simple like beats like this like that band's boring as shit i mean they're yeah. still all super talented that's but they're greta like van way fleet. more that's it becomes greta van fleet then which we've already <laughs> done a grind my gears on uh but bonham i mean his nickname was the fucking beast yeah of uh, that was a, in reference to his drinking more than anything but oh, i, I, I mean else. uh it could have been uh, I don't know much about uh, that. Bullwinkle, what do you think about John yeah, Bonham? Now, yeah, why don't you chime in? I mean, I think it's all been said. I mean, when you think of John Bonham, the thing that comes to mind is just raw power. I mean, yeah. you see... He you know, power you in that the... pocket. <clears throat> God damn it. Yeah. I mean, what are you, you referencing? Think... <laughs> yeah. The, the stories from before he was even with Led Zeppelin. I mean, he was blackballed from so many clubs. Uh, they just... Or blacklisted, blackballed, <laughs> Black, <laughs> blacklisted so many clubs for being too loud. And even when he started recording, um, the manager of that recording studio said uh, his style was unrecordable and it was bad on the equipment. Um, it, that's just who he is. Yeah. So, Funny uh, story. They say that about me too. Oh god. Well, um, you, no one I mean, says that about you. But I was <laughs> drumming on the equipment, so. Yeah, it's a little different. I don't know. Um, it, there's actually, a, I read a funny story. I don't know how true it is, but um, Ludwig, I think it was Ludwig is what he played. Ludwig? Sent, uh, this is America. It's Ludwig, hmm. okay? Um, <laughs> America! Yeah, America. Fuck yeah! Um, but uh, Ludwig sent him a new kit, and it was uh, a double bass kit. And... Uh, Apparently, Jimmy Page forbid the drum or forbade the drum tech from setting up the full 
kit with the double bass pedals, like with the double bass drums, because he said that John Bonham didn't need them. And when when like Bonham was like, come on, man, like I really want to do it. He's like, John, you do more with one foot than most drummers do with two. Like That's true. he yeah. he was just that good. He well, was I, one of there, the most influential drummers of all time. There are some Led Zeppelin songs, which I feel like would just wouldn't work without the way that John Bonham played. Most uh, obviously is the Misty Mountain Hop. That would oh. be such a weird song without how but like uh, awesome those huge drums are in the background. Yeah, I uh, I agree fully. Yep, for um, sure. <laughs> Should right, we... before we move off it what's the favorite led zeppelin song oh for, for the drum oh style. for the drums um yeah. my favorite sound for the drums is when the levy breaks oh that was gonna be mine too <laughs> um yeah i mean i've heard stories about how they got that lift and they were recording in headley That's... headley grange uh, the and they recorded right? in a stairwell yeah and they right. got that huge reverb lift uh, from the from the the stairwell, and as far as the sound goes, that is probably the best uh, best song. I, I have to say. Okay, what was that? <laughs> um, um, anybody uh, else? I'm gonna stick with rock and roll. I think uh, that song is just amazing. Like the drums behind it give it so much energy. It's great. I just played That's mine it. a second ago. It was. I mean, it was a uh, lover lever. Uh, She's just, just a woman. I just think that was a a great Led Zeppelin album. I mean, song. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say let's not get sued. Um, <laughs> great Led Zeppelin's album. Right? I mean, song. Uh, yeah, but um. It, I mean, it's Zeppelin. I have them tattooed on my chest. Like that was Greta Van Fleet. Yeah, I, know. I, I could tell that okay. wasn't the song you were talking. Okay. About. Yeah, I was like, I know it's April Fool's Day, but uh, <laughs> you got you're gonna have to try harder than that. Yeah, I was like, I don't know any Greta Van Fleet songs, so I just <laughs> went to the website and started playing. I was like, God damn it! <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, okay, don't sue so us I'm- because we love you. We're your biggest fans. Oh, yeah. and now we are going to move on to the 1980s. And Badger, you can now take it away with the 1980s. Okay, so mine is probably the the best technical drummer that's on anybody's list here. Um, I could argue with that. That is Neil Peart. He is so, also he's also my 1980s drummer. Is he? Yeah. Okay. So um, he had the jazz influence and he also had a lot of the hard rock influence. He was influenced by like Keith Moon and John Bonham. But at the same time, he tried to like emulate the Gene Krupa and the buddy, buddy rich. And then, um, he was, uh, didn't you say somebody earlier was like a pupil of uh Freddie Gruber? <laughs> what? <laughs> Freddie Gruber. Yeah. <laughs> I th- I think you're losing it, man. Um, no, Hal Blaine. Um, <laughs> Hal Blaine's tutor. I don't know uh, who the Fred same Gruber guy is. There, yeah, you made that name up. No, um... <laughs> isn't he the guy that comes into your nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> dude, he is. Yeah. No. Uh, no. He, Hal he Blaine's killed, like, teacher Depp in that movie, didn't he? No. Ha- yes, he did. <laughs> uh, Hal Blaine's teacher also taught Gene Krupa. Who was an influence right, so on who was his Neil teacher? Pert. His name was Roy Knapp. No, his name was Freddie Gruber. <laughs> no, you're making things up. I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit now. You're because, doing a disservice to yeah, Neil Pert. Because right Badger is a spaz. Um, <laughs> Neil Pert, uh, not only was he the drummer for one of the greatest prog rock bands of all time, uh, he was also the chief songwriter. He wrote the lyrics. To all really? of Rush's, yeah, he was the lyricist for Rush. I didn't um, know that. Yeah, he's yeah, a mega he is. nerd. Uh, he's awesome. I mean, Neil Peart. I, I don't think. He, I mean, a lot of people are like, "Oh, he's the greatest of all time." Have you seen his drum set? Uh, and it's like, yeah, he's got a shit ton of drums. Um, 
I, I, he, I saw a DVD of them playing in, I think it was Rio. And he does the whole like spinning around, playing the electric drums. And that, that's awesome. But he just elevated, especially in the 1980s. Keep in mind, we're talking about when Rush was in the 80s. Uh, Cause I'm pretty sure that they were still a band in the seventies. I'm not a hundred percent on that. Yeah. I they think were they actually active st- from 1968 to 2015 when he retired. Wait, quote unquote retired. Yeah. Um, bec- but they didn't really hit their progressive era uh, until the end of the seventies and into the, into the eighties when they started using like the synth and, and all that stuff, um, which is where a lot of people, when they think of rush, that's the music they think of. Tom Sawyer, that kind of stuff is in 81, I think, uh, on moving pictures, um, subdivisions like 1982 signals. I think my stepdad really likes rush. So I know a lot about them. Uh, sadly, does he know who Gruber is? He probably (laughs) knows who Gruber is, but if you, um, but if, if you look, if you look, rush started taking on more of the progressive rock sound from bands like yes. And King Crimson, things like that. And that's when uh, they they moved away from that like heavy rock and like pure rock and roll sound into what they're known as. Like this is this is when they became Rush. Uh, Rush is variety, basically. Um, so not only is he one of the best drummers of all time, but he's also the lyricist for one of the best prog bands of all time. Now, I, that's one of the reasons he made my list is that he was dynamic. He could do lots of different things, and and he he doesn't really mess up like the guy does exactly what he needs to do on every song he's got great fills he's the best drummer uh i just you know uh he played on um vertical horizons uh critically acclaimed fourth (laughs) album that i've never heard of but according to wikipedia he played (laughs) drums on that and i think he produced it i just made that last part up uh (laughs) but yeah uh vertical horizon if you don't know, is uh, everything you want is one hit wonder from yeah, you want. yeah, from the 1990s. I think like late 90s. I was yeah. on the 90s kick this week. Oh, that sucks. I'm sorry. Hey man, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's I some could great swallow music my pride, <clears throat> choke on the rhymes, laugh at the li- blah 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 inside. <laughs> it's closing time. Darsh and I know that song well. Semi charm life, kind of life yeah. is a good song. Uh, okay, we're getting we're the ADD p- crew is is done talking. So, uh, Bullwinkle, why don't you go next? Shut up, Jeff. All right. <laughs> For '80s, I had Jonathan Moffat, um, and I'm reluctant to use this term again because I'm afraid Badger's going to have some smart ass comment. But he is the ideal pocket drummer. Um, he was the inventor of the one handed cymbal catch. Uh, he was given the nickname Sugarfoot just because of his crazy bass drum technique. He, uh, it, by, by the way, everybody has heard this guy play drums. You may not know his name, oh, yeah. but you've heard him. Yeah. And he was primarily Michael Jackson's drummer, but he <laughs> toured with Madonna. He worked a lot with Stevie Wonder, Lionel Richie, Quincy Jones, Elton John. Um, the man's got a resume. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's the really cool thing he's doing now is he's putting up YouTube videos and he does drum covers of all his songs that he's actually played on. And just Trout. to see him play through those is insane. And he's the the control that he has is phenomenal. I can't say enough good things about him. He's a he's a great drummer. Uh, yeah, he he is um, one of the like names that everyone should know and no one knows. Right. Um. He he just. I mean, shit. If you just took his Michael Jackson playing into consider consideration, you'd be like, oh yeah, this guy's like amazing. But then. You add everything else on top of it. Like he's played with Elton. He's played with Madonna. He's played with Stevie Wonder. He's played with Diana Ross. The list goes fucking on. Uh, So good fucking choice. I wish I had thought to use him when I made my list. Uh, Darsh, your 1980s drummer is Phil Collins, right? No, it's not. Um, (laughs) not, But uh, I actually did consider Phil Collins. It was only a partial troll. So... uh, I'm not. I'm not going to talk about Phil Collins. I'm going to talk about uh, who my choice is. But, Phil uh, Collins can suck it. 
Dude, he's... he did the Tarzan themes track. Yeah, he... I know. He beat Bigger, Longer, Uncut, and he shouldn't have. Well, anyways, l- l- listen. Let's not digest here. Yeah, I mean, digress. I, 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 dig- <laughs> I digest. I'm digesting um, some lasagna right now. Uh, nice. um, we, uh, okay, so who did I choose? I chose uh, Lars Ulrich, the, uh, or Ulrich, uh, dep- the uh, drummer of Metallica. And uh, I got to say, the 80s were, <laughs> were a hard decade for me to choose. You know, I'm, I'm not a drummer, so I don't really, like, pay attention to, like, virtuosity of drummers that often. You know, I love a good drummer. It's just, like, not something I really focus on. Uh, I even thought about making the best drummer of the 1980s a, a drum machine. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, I like, thought about that. Which would have been blasphemy, I know. Uh, so at the end of the day, I was just like, what drummer from the 80s do I just like the best? And uh, yeah, I decided on Lars just because his work in the 80s was so uh, forward thinking in terms of like pushing the metal genre uh, forward. Just because like, you know, that metal style of drums had really just gone from like the hard rock uh style to like all right this is metal drums now um and he was doing that super early like uh you know metallica was playing as early as like 1981 like uh kill them all like all all these like uh metal slash uh thrash punk thrash metal tunes and uh you know, he just, uh, it, it was great. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was exactly what that music needed. Uh, it was, he's highly influential. Um, so yeah, Lars Ulrich, that, that's my choice. Uh, I can't completely bash your choice. Lars is a good drummer for Metallica. I thought that the, he was the lead singer of Metallica. You're wrong. That's James Hetfield. Oh, wait, no, that's Freddy (laughs) Gruber. That's who he is. But Lars was lucky enough to play with one of the greatest bass players of all time. For Uh, sure. Cliff Burton. Yeah, Cliff. Cliff Burton. Um, And that I think that's the time period that you're really referring to as. Yeah. Like uh, like. the when they were like, you know, Master Puppets era. Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning. That era. Yeah. Yeah. I've been listening um, to a lot of Ride the Lightning recently. No, nothing wrong with that. I, I'm not the biggest Metallica fan, but I mean, Ride the Lightning, Master Puppets, uh, you know, amazing albums. Um, right. A lot of people will say like the Black Album, but like uh, the Black Album is great too. It's I mean, great, but, but uh, it, it's not the same. But can we all just agree? It, it's no Saint Anger. I mean, that's the greatest Metallica <laughs> album of all time. I think that's the yeah, only yeah. one I ever, yeah. I listened to like one song off there. So I think it's the most I've ever listened to Metallica. That, that's really I, unfortunate. That especially, is unfortunate. Especially since the drumming on that album is so bad. Like, uh, yeah. And it's not because his technique is bad. It's just like they had this crazy idea to tune the drums super low like to like C or something like to Matt because all the guitars were in drop C and they were like, Oh, let's uh, tune down the drums to uh, match the guitars. And it just sounded horrible. Like I, they ditched it later on. Um, but I haven't listened to them with any, the, the music, I, po- the music post St. Anger isn't that bad, but I haven't listened to a Metallica album since with the same expectations. That's mm. how. That's how, you know, disappointing that album was. Um, yeah, I can. But, yeah, but you know, they were pretty old at that point. Didn't so they? I'm, I'm, I'm didn't not really they an, a, too upset by it. An album that was like mixed so loud, it was named like the loudest album like mastered ever, and the fans like protested, and they eventually had to redo it and like turn everything down. Uh, but I've, it was. Like, I have no idea. Yeah, it's it's a fact. <laughs> if you a, if you say so. Yeah, you, um, you're you're Mister Reliable tonight. So uh, I am. All right. So for the we're gonna move on to the '90s. And for the '90s, I'm actually going to go first. 
because the other three members of the band all agreed on who their favorite drummer from the 90s was or who they thought was you? the best. There's nothing wrong with, with your choice. In fact, he was going to be my no, first until I really thought nothing wrong with me. Oh. Uh, anyways, uh, my favorite or the, my choice for best drummer of the 90s is actually uh, Danny Carey from the band Tool. Um, the man is a freak of nature, in my opinion, when it comes to drumming. He, he's, um, he, he's like, throws it, he's really good with, uh, when it comes to odd time signatures and like throwing in polyrhythms and polymeters. And I don't know how the fuck he does it. I have tried to play along with, you know, some tool songs and I just have a rough fucking go of it. Um, I haven't developed that far as a drummer yet, but even beyond that, he's played with, uh, some, he played with the Melvins. Um, he's not like a founding member or anything, but he, he played with the Melvins. He's played with King, uh, with Andrew, uh, Ballou of King Chris, uh, Crimson. He's played with Carol King, a skinny puppy. The, he, he's played with some great bands, most well known for tool. But if you want to hear amazing amazing progressive drums you gotta listen to tool um there he he takes drums to like a really weird place and it's amazing and that's all i'm gonna say about it because i know the other guys want to uh um oh and he's played with less claypool so let's just yeah um so we're gonna like a, a drummer that plays with a lot of amazing bass players then he does play with a lot of amazing bass players as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm a bassist at heart. You, you know this. Like, right. if, if they hook up, if they do well together, that's, uh, that's I'm, I'm signed in. I'm, I'm ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to uh, pass you guys the buck. I'm going to suggest that uh, Bullwinkle starts off the 90s and reads your guys' pick. Sure. So, 90s, we had Dave Grohl. Yeah. Um, I'm trying no, to no remember what the, yeah the name of the band he was with that uh influenced <laughs> that uh the Grugers <clears throat> the meat the Grugers <laughs> I mean they wanted to be the meat puppets yeah yeah uh, all jokes aside he was a uh not a founding member but uh joined after their first album right after yeah. Bleach yeah uh Nirvana yeah right. yeah all right continue. Yeah, I mean, I really don't have too much on him. I kind of view him as the next generation John Bonham. I mean, the guy is just loud and in your face, and he kind of has that same style that Bonham had when he was playing. Um, and I'm really kind of um, drawn to that, so that's why I put him on there. But So last night I was actually watching uh, Nirvana um, live from Reading, uh, and that, that was like in 92. Amazing. And... Uh, he was just killing it, man. Like, uh, he, so uh, I I did notice when I was watching that a lot of Kurt Cobain's guitar playing is very, uh, like abstract and like distorted and just like noise rocky. And I feel like if he didn't have Dave Grohl backing him up, it would just be almost incoherent not that you know Kurt Cobain didn't have an ear for structure he just hid it behind this wall of like abstract noise um especially live and uh he just held that band together and his like Bullwinkle says his drums were so loud and aggressive and uh, tight as well. Um, and especially later in the Foo Fighters, like the, um, you know, I, I know that he wasn't the primary drummer for the Foo Fighters, but obviously he, he was very influential. Like the, he did the, the first album's drums, right? And then Taylor Hawking came before the first tour. Did he um, do the color and the shape? I think, hold on, I got to think about this. Because I was reading earlier, the original I don't drummer tell just you, wasn't yes. fitting. Um, I, I know that he did the first album. Like, all, but that was all, he did everything. It was all him. Um, he, uh, he announced earlier today that he was running for president in 2020. No, no he, he, I mean, he should do it. I think it was a joke, but. Um, 
It might. I mean, he but, wants to yeah, make the, America rock again. Oh, I'm down with that. But uh, yeah, the original drummer and percussionist was a guy named William Goldsmith. Um, I I don't really I've I've never heard of. Oh yeah, he was in Sunny Day Real Estate because Foo Fighters basically absorbed Sunny Day Real Estate. Um, it was a, a super influential uh, emo band, uh, quote unquote emo band. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there he he uh, he was the original drummer. He definitely did the first two recordings. I think he did Foo Fighters and the Color and the Shape. He recorded all the drums for that. Um, okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, his later work with so I was right. Stone Age is great. And yeah, uh, he's just great. Uh, you were you were partially right. Yeah, he is. He's uh, he's amazing. He almost made my list. Honestly, uh, I just picked Danny Carey because I wanted to be an outsider on this one. You just wanted to be special. Yep, just wanted to be special because literally every other choice I had up until this point, uh, someone else has also chosen. Basically, yeah. Um, I do have a a, a trivia question for you guys on Dave Grohl. Oh yeah. So in November 2018, he was asked what band he wanted to play with. November 2018, and yeah. uh, is the trivia question what was his response? Correct. Um, right, give me a second. Was um, it the Sex Pistols. Oh, it was. So, it was. Um, yeah. It was Imagine Dragons. No. What? It's <laughs> a joke. It's a joke. Is that a real answer? Or Greta what? Van Fleet and, <laughs> no. and Gruber. Uh, <laughs> um, hmm. uh, can you give us a hint? Are they still a band or are they broken up? They're still a band, kind of. Okay. I mean, they're old. They're from the 80s, primarily. Mm. Uh, talking Heads. Nope. Okay, so it's a Red if Hot it's from the peppers. 80s. No, it's definitely a punk band. Um, Why isn't yeah, Google telling you? I guarantee it's, it's a punk band. You're Googling it, you that's, bum? That's Google not how it. trivia works. Um, well, it's not working anyway. Um, They're listening uh, to us. It's a punk band. I know I know it's got to be a punk band. I, I can't think of Was who it the it Foo Fighters? Though. It was ACDC. What oh, fuck? my oh, God. God. Get out of here. He probably that's because he could. could that's because he could do that all electronically with the Def Leppard drummer's <laughs> drum kit. Yeah, and I don't know if he feet. was trolling or not, but I'm I'm going to include it. I think that was pretty cool. So uh, it's a it's an interesting factoid. Yeah. For those yeah. of you listening at home, uh, Bullwinkle has an unhealthy uh, obsession with ACDC. It's not unhealthy. Well, okay, <laughs> it's not an obsession. I have it's respect not- for what they did. Any that's affinity? Cool. That's enough. That's unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We, we are going to move on to our modern drummers. Uh, and we are going to start out with Badger, who is your modern, as in the 2000s to today, drummer? Quest Love. That's a good choice, but I know that's not who you picked. No, it is. I changed. Uh, without telling us? Oh, Why man. do I need I to tell scared. you everything I do? I didn't pick Quest Love in the building. All right. All right, I I can get down with Questlove. Yeah, everybody can. That's why he's That's, on my list. He's he Questlove. Is, yeah, he can make his drum sound so perfect that it sounds like it's a drum machine. And then he can go off of that and purposely deviate from that to make the record sound uh, just so much better and... Uh, he just can pr- he's produced so much albums for everybody and he's just a genius he knows like what beat per minute any song you can tell him he'll be able to just find it immediately he's uh very influential for uh the hip hop is what people are listening to now and so i felt that we should have some representation on the list you know what um, i actually like this better than your original choice uh, uh nothing against his original choice was uh brian uh Viglione, Viglione. right yep yeah and he's amazing from amazing the dresden drummer. dolls yeah and uh he actually played on the violent femmes uh when they got back together back to 2013 to 2016 he was their drummer uh, oh that makes a lot of sense but uh i'm really glad that you uh you picked quest love because he was actually my second choice 
uh, th- like th- when I started really thinking about this list. Um, and he, yeah, like you said, he has like an encyclopedic knowledge of drums. When it comes to drums, like he knows everything about it. Uh, he's really big on getting kids into drumming. Uh, I know he he released like a pocket kit. Uh, you know, it's like a like a it stores within itself, but it sounds good on like a, a that's child's what Hal kit. Blaine used, right? Oh god damn it! I hate you so much. But um, I mean, he's played with so many like people and he produced records for what Elvis Costello, uh, Erica Badu, Jay-Z, Amy Winehouse, Al Green, like the John dude Legends. is everywhere. John Legend. The Roots. Um, I mean, and yes, he's, he's one of the, the founding members of the Roots. Philly represent. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I mean, and he's still like so active. I, I mean, I, the Roots are the house band for, uh, the Tonight Show with yep. Jimmy Fallon, and he um, uh, he talked about how that has changed his drumming style because he's had to do so many different songs and stuff. That and it's also um, just being able to be at home, not tour all the time, but mm-hmm. he can you know just commute to New York and he can really spend time and really uh, become friends again with the band's members instead of just co-workers they never he was talking about he they never rehearse before a show or before tours or anything they just go out there and play and that for the tonight show they have to play the same thing all the time it i mean they have to it's new stuff so they have to really rehearse and interact with each other and that it's really made the band stronger uh all this was on this really cool two part episode of the broken record podcast, which is uh, really interesting. I would check that one out after you check out all ours and donate to our Patreon <laughs> and uh, just send money to Badger, you know, do it. <laughs> also, uh, he, I mean, he's, he, I mean, he's quest freaking love. He's uh, do yourself a favor and watch. He actually was on two episodes of drunk history. Funny. Um, yeah, it, they're really good episodes. Um, I don't, oh, I can't remember the topics. Oh, that makes me feel bad. Um, but yeah, his his drunk histories are really good. The dude is super freaking smart. And there's a stigma that comes with drummers that drummers are stupid, and it's bullshit. I wonder why. It's bullshit because they play the drums with their head. That is only you. <laughs> he's but, also a uh, somewhat regular on the Eric Andre show. Yeah, I know he's. I was gonna say he's been on the Eric Andre show. Uh, yeah. He's awesome. I mean, he's quest freaking love. Uh, we are going to now move on to Bullwinkle's 1990s pick, 2000s pick. Oh, 2000s pick! Wow, Get I am it uh, right. I, Not I, even I, in the right decade. For I sure. just went on a rant about how drummers aren't stupid, and then said something <laughs> stupid. <laughs> That feels bad, man. That seems fair. All right, yeah. so for 2000s, I had Brandon Steinecker. Um, This yeah. is a purely personal choice. I know there are many better drummers out there from the past 20 years or so. Um, but when I was learning to play drums, the primary drummers I would play along with were Phil Rudd from ACDC. And then once I got a little better and was able to master like the one and three and you know counting all yeah. that stuff, I moved on to listening to the used and doing trying to match some of those fills and get some of those rhythms down. So he's really influential on my style. I know he's probably not the greatest drummer out there, but he plays for rancid. He played, yeah. he's been playing for him for a long time. I didn't know that he was, a, he is a good drummer. He is really good, but so yeah, yeah that's all I, I had. I have, I have no complaints with that choice. That is a very good choice. Uh, I mean, I, is he the first, I mean, I guess Dave Grohl was kind of a punk. I'm gonna say he might he he might be the first true punk to make the uh the list. But uh good good choice. Um so Darsh and I actually both put the same drummer for our two thousands drummer. Uh and Darsh, would you like to tell the people who that is? Uh, so it is uh John Theodore of um many, many bands, but uh for me he is the uh, original awesome drummer from the Mars Volta. 
Um, and the Mars Volta released their two best albums with him, uh, you know, on drums. Uh, that would be De Laos and the Comitorium and Francis the Mute. And uh, when I first heard that band, I, I just... I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. And that is not something that happens very often. I just like, they were so aggressive uh, and out there. And, you know, we, we talk about John Bonham being loud and aggressive. This is completely different. The, you know, uh, it's just like, they've got, it, it's not just solid rock and roll. It's like some, it, there's like a lot of Latin elements to it. There's a ton of jazz um you know influences going on um obviously you have your rock influences and you can hear all of it and uh it just is out of this world um and i mean that in the sense that like it sounds like it's from another planet <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh john theodore um i think he played on like five albums with mars volta before um Omar was like, Hey, Hey man, like you're like, why don't you like move on? Um, I don't think it's five. I think it's, uh, I know he was on. Francis no, it's, Demi it's Demi five. Hold on. And, and, Ac 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 I, I, I can never. Remember. So it's a uh, tremulant. It's an EP. So I'm not going to, okay. It's not actually an album. Uh, then there's D Laust. Then there's um, live recordings that, that were released. Francis, the mute um scabidates is another live recording that the mars volta did and then amputecture okay i can't believe i said that right but um i'm really surprised i said that right but he's also played with um uh brandon boyd from uh incubus he played on he, he was the drummer for his solo one of his solo records he's one of the founding members as one day uh, of one day as a lion with zach de la rocha from uh rage Mm -hmm. um and he's the current drummer for queens of the stone age um so i mean he filled the shoes of dave grohl and is still doing that that's a big that's a big big deal um but yeah his his sound like you were saying it's so aggressive but in a different way from a bonham who is one of his biggest influences he says um it, it's uh i don't think i've ever heard anybody be able to switch parts like he does um like a lot of it has to do with omar's uh writing style um a, a real large part of it has to do with omar's writing style but um it, he, I, I i don't know like what, what what's the song i'm thinking of um I, I can't remember the song it's it's off of um geez louise it's off of francis the mute um, but he, he's able to just like go from this insanely aggressive, like, just like, oh my, like, like face melting, like drums into this like nice, relaxed Latin beat. And, Is it, oh, um, Elvia, Elvia Elvia, yeah, Elvia, Elvia, love via quiz. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say I, that. <laughs> and I mean, the guy just has chops like a motherfucker. I, there aren't very many drummers working today that have the kind of chops that he does. Um, I mean, you might be able to uh, like, he, he creates the same drum sound as a band, like the sounds of animals fighting, but they have two guys playing drums. They have a guy on a set and then a guy playing uh, a bass drum with sticks. And he's able to do that all by himself. Uh, and I mean, he left and he ended up being replaced by like a drummer. That's just happens to be just as good. Tom um, with Tom, yeah, uh, who who is an amazing, amazing drummer, another amazing drummer. But like, I, I actually had him on my list until uh, I, you know, considered John Theodore. Yeah, it's it's oh my god, it, it I I fucking love John Theodore, and but it, part of it has to do with the fact that I love the Mars Volta so much. Um, but yeah, I I, I think that he's. He embodies everything in in my mind of what a good drummer should be able to do, and that's played just just about everything. Because if you look at all the people on our list, they could play anything. Yeah, every single one of them. 
they're all genre bending like you know keith moon could jazz it up like a motherfucker they could all get out of the pocket they could all get out of the pocket but they were all good at being in the pocket as well except for maybe bonham he'd like to he could still do the the pocket drumming though is quest but, yeah. love a pocket drummer yes mike quest and loves Bo- in the oh, yeah. I, I would agree with that yeah he he quest love never does anything like can you teach me to be a pocket flashing. drummer can no, can you need you, rhythm? Yeah, you need rhythm, dude. You don't <laughs> I have can rhythm. I can do six eight one lolly two lolly one lolly two lolly. Uh, now, can you do that while moving your whole body? I am moving my whole body, man. I'm always moving my whole body. I mean, spa- I'm on spazzing an exercise doesn't count. bike right now. I I believe you for some reason, and I don't know why. It's fun. So, um, uh, yeah. What did we? What I don't know about you guys, but this was the hardest, uh, most difficult list for me to come up with, just because. Uh, Mine kinda, was like, the opera singer one. <laughs> that one will remain unreleased because your opinions on on uh, uh, what is that guy's name? Botticelli. Uh, Botticelli. Yeah, they're just wrong, man. You're just wrong. But I'm he's sorry. so overrated. I, I know. Let's just not get into it. Anyways, uh, that one will remain in the can forever. We are not letting you people hear that train wreck. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> Bullwinkle, Bullwinkle did do a very, very good impression, though. Uh, that wasn't bad. I was uh, hit I, all it. those high. He has a yeah. beautiful singing voice. He yes, did beautiful. a beautiful magical flute. Mm. And then he put it into his pocket drummer. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, as far as putting the list together, it wasn't too bad for me. I definitely knew who my uh, like 70s and 80s was going to be. But the uh, the 60s was a little difficult at first until I really sat back. Oh, the 60s was so easy. I still um, don't know only, who's on my list. That was the only freebie. <laughs> for you, that was the only freebie? Yeah. I mean, Mitch Mitchell was my first thought. It, he was. And then I, I like, and then it was like, oh, yeah, but what about Keith Moon? And it's like, oh, well, shit. Um, but yeah, I didn't have too difficult of a time putting this together. Luckily I pay attention to the drums a lot. So it was easy once I like sat back to remember who, who some of my favorite drummers were. I think it was difficult for me because I'm a big fan of understated drumming and, uh, I mean, you know, it like Phil, Phil Selway Selway. of of Radiohead. I knew you were going to fucking say it it. is (laughs) extreme, is extremely talented and extremely, you know, low key. Um, he also learned from Gruber. Yeah. Oh, did he, he learn he, from Gruber? Yeah. He's a Gruberite as they're as they're known. Oh, um, but uh, it, you know, I, I'm more attracted to that kind of like almost electronic kind. Well, of, y- you um, were considering putting a drum machine on the list, so yeah, yeah, that makes uh, sense. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a piece of shit. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I think he just said it for all of us. Uh, <laughs> So uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next week. Bye-bye. 12 Bar News Podcast was recorded at 12 Years Dungeon Studios in Trenton, New Jersey. The sound engineer, Jeff Damon. Webmaster, Daniel Marshall. Resident Iowan, Mike Stanley. And your host slash delinquent, Patrick Stofflet. Thanks for tuning in. 12 Years Dungeon! (laughs) 